Hello again, boys and girls, and welcome to episode four of the series that is entirely dedicated to building a solution architecture document. And we have three more views that we will address in this video. And the first one is the data view, a section mostly used by database admin and development teams to understand the database schema and how the data has been put into tables and how these tables relate to each other within the database. And you know my opinion about relational databases and how I think they should not be our first choice in 2022. But if you are designing a relational database to go with the solution, it's in this document or in this section or in this view that the ERD, the Entity Relationship Diagram, would go, which will have the goal of listing all the data objects that need to be considered when developing the application. The second view we will be looking at as well is the security view that include all security aspects of the application, obviously, including but not limited to identity and access management, IAM, PCI compliance, given that we're building a transactional feature and customers will be providing their credit card, for example, so we need to think about how are, are we going to store those credit card information and other PII data like customer's address, customer's names. It's also in this section that we will detail how are we going to be um, approaching data encryption at transit, at rest, um, how are we going to be rotating the keys, and there's also the aspect of compliance, right? So if we are going to be launching this feature in Europe, for example, we need to think about GDPR compliance and how to enable users to download their data. California has its own California Act, Japan has its own thing, Australia has its own thing, China has its own thing. So we got to think about all this compliance and regulations when we are building the application. Another aspect also that we want to include in the security view is everything about um, threat modeling, right? We want to we wanna anticipate risk. We want to think about how hackers or malicious actors would gain, would want to gain access to our application and, and what kind of vulnerabilities we might have. And so we want to start anticipating all these kind of risks. And third, given the nature of the application we've been building so far, I chose to add a special uh, view that targets third-party vendors and partners. So we'll get to all that in detail in this video. And as usual, since the beginning of the series, and as usual, since the beginning of the series, we will be building this. And as usual, and as usual for this series, and as usual, And as usual, since the beginning of the series, we will be using Google Drive to build uh, the solution architecture document. My name is Ilias. I'm a senior solutions architect. Now let's do this. And you see here that I added a new file, the 06 data view, and within it, let me zoom in a little bit and within it. So I just added a small description, um, just as a reminder, so when you clone this whole folder, you can remember what goes into what file. And as you can see here, I included the entity relationship diagram. Let me just put everything in white. That's too shiny for my eyes at 7 p.m. in the North Hemisphere. And to be honest, I didn't see any advantage in rebuilding an ERD. So I Googled e-commerce database entity relationship diagram, and I found the couple of examples and I used this one. Yeah, you know, just a dummy example to illustrate what goes in here. Now, you know that, you know, my, my point uh, about not using um, um, relational databases in 2022, and I got a lot of backlash when I posted that short uh, about this, also on LinkedIn when I po posted that. My point was that when relation, relationship databases were created back in the 60s and the 70s, storage was super, super expensive, right? We didn't have cloud. So basically what we used to do, or the solution that we came up with is to optimize storage is to segment uh, the data, right? So I'm going to store, for example, all my products into this table, and I'm going to store all my users into this specific table. And then only when I need both of them that I'm going to use CPU, right? To execute a join query, to get data from the left, from the right, join them, then return one stream of data. In 2022, we don't have that problem. We don't have that storage problem anymore. So I think it's time we start 
challenges the status quo and think a little bit more about how we can use documents based um, storage, you know, document based databases, MongoDB, DynamoDB, there's a ton of them out there. Data that is accessed together need to be stored together. And the fact of the matter is most of world's largest online retailers like like Walmart, like eBay, you know, they use NoSQL databases to power their e-commerce companies. So I just wanted to explain myself here. Um, that was just a tangent. So now let's go back to the episode. And another thing I tend to add to the data view and you want to add as well is a recommendation towards which database class or instance or type I want to use. And re you remember, we have our non-functional requirements and if we've done them correctly, then we should have a, a good idea about the type of data that we need to store and, and all the requirements around them. And so what I you do usually is I go to this website called instances.vintage.sh. I'll add the link into the description because it allows me to compare AWS's offering when it comes to RDS um, instances. For example, I'm going for the M5 class. You know, I'm not sure between either I go M5 large or 12X large and I just compare them. And you know, I can see in terms of memory, CPUs, the cost if it was on Postgres, the cost if it was on MySQL, the cost of if it was on Aurora, and also whether it's a reserved instances or not. And you know, I can it gives me a good idea. So once I find the perfect database, and there's no perfect database, usually we're going to deploy, monitor, and then right size. That means either provision uh, a higher class or a lower class, and then monitor again, and then you know until we find that sweet spot between cost performance. But for now, let's say I have chosen to go with an M5 12X large. And the M5 class, for example, is regarded as a great choice when you have a broad range of, you know, workloads like what we have right now, like web application servers, um, small and mid-sized databases, cluster computing, gaming servers, uh, and all that. So it's actually in this document that I'm going to add my suggestion. And I always call it suggestion or recommendation because I want to leave the final say to the developers themselves and to, to the database admin uh, themselves, you know, the, the people who actually will be building uh, and maintaining the solution. I just say, this is my recommendation based on analysis that we've done and, you know, you're free to follow it or not. But if, say, instead of building a relational database, if I was building an event-driven application with multiple persistence, data persistence layers, then it's in this document that I will describe the data flow or the data prop propagation between all the involved components in a sequence manner and because sometimes when the data traverses a certain layer or certain components um, you need to you know massage the data you need to enrich the data you need to customize it you need to aggregate some other stuff to it so it's actually it would go in this document as well but for the sake of simplicity we're just keeping the ERD for now all right and now let's move on to the security view I'm just going to duplicate my file here. I actually loved it when Google Drive introduced the copy paste feature. Let's rename this. So what goes into this document? We probably, we might have some diagrams here and there to describe some threat models, for example, but most of it, usually what ends up here is paragraphs of text. We want to describe a ton of stuff around our application from a security perspective. How we expect users to authenticate. If encryption is required, well, how are we going to encrypt our data? When, how, where, using what key, how frequently we are going to be rotating them, who owns them, and all that kind of stuff. Say this is a new application that we're building from scratch. What is our password Policy. What is our password retention policy, for example? Password and credentials policies. Again, there will be a big part about compliance, regulation as well, which will depend on the type of application you're building, the market you're targeting, the type of, um, you know, if it's an e-commerce application, for example, the type of um, products you're selling, right? I, I know just on top of my head, if you're shipping a device that has batteries in it, for example, you need to ship it using a different carrier versus if you're shipping t-shirts or something like that. And you need to be aware of all these nuances around your business when you are building a solution. Something also that I always mention and I always add here is, how's it called again? The AWS model where AWS takes care of 
security of the cloud and us as customers security in the cloud. It's, it's the AWS shared responsibility model. So I always tend to go through it again and see if something has changed since the last time I looked into it. And I would, because you know, these documents, I'm not building them for myself. I'm building them for all the stakeholders. So I would usually use this image or take a screenshot of it and then add it to the document and, and then go through these components here and explain how they relate to our application a little bit. Customer data, for example, uh, the platform, if we are using, let's say containers or whatever, how are we going to secure those containers and whether they are our responsibility. I mean, of course, obviously the, our, our um, responsibility I want to talk about networking, firewall configuration. So this is where I will add them also here. Like our application is accessible through browsers. So we have obviously to open port 80, port 443, but let's say uh, there's some FTP access required, um, some web sockets needs to be opened. Maybe we're sending notifications using, I don't know, different like MQTT protocol for IoT stuff. So I will, you know, add that information into the security view and then try to make it as precise as possible and as clear as, as possible who is responsible for what from a team's perspective. Because in case of a breach or in case of a problem, um, you don't want people running left and right and center trying to figure out who is responsible for what you want to like if you have time and, and you can even write playbooks that describe how to react in, in, a, in a type of a uh, you know crisis whatever that would be perfect and so our security view ends up looking something similar like this where we go again through all these aforementioned components Let's zoom out and let's do a quick recap. Let's see what we have built so far. There are a ton of views out there and depending on the type of the application you're building, you get to choose which views to include because it's all actually depends on your uh, application. I wanted throughout the series to democratize the, the, the building a solution architecture document and just you know walk you through uh, the the process that i do and and the thinking that i do uh, i will add one last view for the sake of this series otherwise building the views for the sake of building views will become a full-time job and there are a lot more to solution architecture than just writing all these views so we gotta move on but the last view i want to show you is what we call the integration view and it's basically Hmm, you know what? Let me show you. So we go back to our Lucid Chart diagram and I will take the conceptual view as a starting point. Let me copy it, create a new view here. And this is not a, uh, what would you call a standard view? But I think in 2022, with the type of applications that we build in and, and how we rely on a whole ecosystem of third party applications, vendors, components, dependencies, I think it's important to just give you a quick glimpse on what I would usually add into the integration architecture. So we have here our reporting service. I wanna create another one that I'm going to, companies usually have an ERP, an enterprise resource planning um, system, something like that. And so basically in the integration architecture, I'm trying to just showcase how my application interacts with all the ecosystem of third parties around it. So let's say, you know, we will have a sales representative and the salesman basically enters information into the ARP. The data from the ERP flows to the data lake, of course, because we want to generate reports and we want to build analytical on top of that. Another third party is payments. And you've seen that we haven't touched on payments so far. So I'm just going to add here a credit card. That is, so this is another third party components that we use, right? And let's call it payments provider. And because we are selling cars, you know, we don't produce them. These cars come from manufacturers. So we must have some kind of supplier. So that probably will be a whole system that we plug into. So we shall have like a, a microservice here that checks that car supplier for new cars, updated editions, whatever, whatever, and then updates our um, databases and, and data lake and stuff like that. And I wanna call it, um, I don't know, manufacturer system, 
Yeah, you know what we say? The two hardest things in software engineers are naming variables and validating cache. I don't know who said that. I just, l let me know in the comments. I, I can't remember who said that, but I think it's, it's totally true. Yeah, these are, you know, just a few outsiders, a few, a few third party um, um, services or vendors or suppliers that we, that we interact with pretty much every day. And, and part of going through this exercise and, and actually thinking about them and defining them and adding them is, you know, understanding how they interact with our application. For example, the manufacturer will have to, up, I mean, we have to update our catalog frequently. So it pushes me to think, how am I going to uh, uh, plug into that specific system? How frequently the updates, the, the, the vendor catalog are going to be done, uh, ports, firewalls, permissions, and stuff like that. I don't wanna leave this kind of decisions to you know developers and, and no offense there, but um, when you take, when you make these decisions while you are writing code, you tend to, well, you tend not to think about them uh, properly. So I want us, I want myself and developers to sit beforehand and think about these and take those decisions together. Payment providers, well, you want to think about all this compliance that we thought about, sales representative. I mean, yeah, and, and probably the integration view will not have all these details. So usually rather than put in all you know, payment service here. Like I would usually remove all the services and I would just call this backend services and just define all these interactions between themselves. Another one would be accounting, whether we're using something like SAP or do we have an SAP icon? I'd be surprised if we didn't. Yeah, let's put it here. And now it, push, it pushes me to think about, hmm, how am I going to share the data to SAP? Whether the data needs to be real time? Do I just allow SAP to read directly from the data lake? Maybe I have a data mesh uh, architecture here. Uh, maybe there's a specific microservice that is consuming all these events and uh, pushing them towards the SAP. So it pushes me uh, to think about all these kind of things. For now, I'll just put it here and then we'll say that SAP reads from the data lake. And that was it, you guys. I think four episodes about solution architecture documents is enough. If we want to, we can stretch it to 20, 30 episodes, but I think you got the gist of it. I will share the documents, the links and everything into YouTube description below. Feel free to download them, use them as a template. If you make any change and you want it to be reflected onto, on the template, please reach out to me. You have my Twitter handler, you have my LinkedIn handler, leave a comment, join us on Discord. I have a ton of other ideas that I want to discuss on the channel. So let me know what you think about the series. Give the video a like, it helps tremendously and you know what thank you for watching until the end this is a technical niched uh, channel every support is appreciated give the video a like subscribe to the channel for more content like this one and enjoy the rest of your day the rest of your night wherever you are ciao